thanks for coming down, guys. This is uh, oh yeah. So yeah, this is the first physical Friday hack session that's been held in the last like one and a half years. So we hope you guys are excited to come uh, to be here, and thanks to the people on Zoom as well. So uh, yeah, so today's first talk will be on video streaming um, from Netflix to Zoom. And it will be given by our own NUS SOC Prof, Prof Wee Wei Tang. Uh, I think a lot of us might know Prof Wee from um, the modules he's taken for us, like CS 2030S or CS 1010. Um, and yeah, so I'll just uh, hand the mic over to him so that he can give us talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me take a minute to uh, over here. All right, um, here we go. Okay, can you see me? Uh, okay. I think we can take this one down. Uh, I think, yeah, I think this will be better. All right, so good evening, everyone. Um, ha very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to come um, and give this Friday Hacks talk. So um, the title of my talk uh, is from Netflix to Zoom. Uh, I want to start with a disclaimer, right? Netflix and Zoom didn't pay me to do this. Um, I don't own any Netflix or Zoom stocks. Right. In fact, I, I paid Netflix and I paid for and you had paid Zoom right to use your services. But uh, I, when I come up with the talk title, I thought I should call it you know, from video on demand to video conferencing to visual video streaming. But it is just too long; it doesn't have the right rings to it. Okay, so I'll just call it you know, from Netflix to Zoom. Now a little bit more about myself. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm an associate professor in computer science. And I've been with NUS since 1992. I joined as an undergraduate then. And interestingly, uh, when I was a student, I'm part of something called uh, No Sleep. And it was like uh, NUS hackers in the old days. There's a few of us, uh, we write interesting tools, utilities, libraries, and then we go and bug the system administrators. You know, please install this in the in the Unix or in the VAC system so that all the students can use our tool. Right? So we kind of like a small band of uh, hackers back in those days. Um, so I have taught several modules. So um, uh, as you know, I taught 1010, 2030S. Uh, I also taught CS 1020 before, which is like your CS 2040 divided by two. Right? Uh, uh, it's also a data structure course. I taught networking, OS, advanced networking, and so on. And my research is in uh, interactive multimedia systems, which include like, things like video streaming, network virtual environments, and as a side hobby, you know, I work with students to build some uh, AI systems or applications. So when I got the invitation you know, to, to give a talk, um, the email said, you know, I can talk about anything that I'm passionate about. And I think a little bit, they say, hey, you know, uh, I know about video streaming, and we've been using video streaming daily now, right? So uh, why don't I tell you a little bit more about this? So here we are today. 
So um, before I continue, uh, so this is all right. Um, before I continue, maybe can I see a show of hand? How many of you have taken CS two one zero five point two? All right. So so about half. Right. Um, so in my talk description, I promise that I will give a very brief introduction to to some networking because we need to um, have some base, basic uh, understanding uh, before I talk about video stream. So this is like no uh, CS two hundred five highly highly simplified into uh, one slide. So. We have two hosts, uh, two machines, two computers, and uh, they are connected over the network. And we say that they are connected by a link. Now, this is highly simplified, of course, but conceptually, they are connected by a link. And then they can then talk to each other. And they talk to each other by sending packets. Right? So packets are like small batches of one and zeros that they send to each other. And they have to follow certain protocols. That's right. Us humans, when we talk to each other, we follow certain rules. Like we say, hello, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? And other people will say yes or no, right? So, so there are certain protocols that we follow. Now, a packet will take some time uh, as it travels through the link or through the network to reach the destination. And there are two factors uh, 205 people know there are three, but I, I throw away one. So there are two factors that affect how long this packet will take to reach the destination. So the first is how fast the host can send, right? Uh, how fast the host can send. And second is that you know, how long it takes for the packets to travel. So you can think of this like, uh, let's take an MRT, right? So when you take the MRT, there are one factor is that how long does it take for you to enter the train, right? So that's like the first of the transmission uh, rate. The second is that once you go into MRT, the, the train will travel to the destination. So that's the uh, propagation delay, how long it takes to travel. Now you imagine that if your MRT has lots of doors, like what we have now, then the transmission rate is higher because we have multiple doors, people can get in and off the train quickly. In certain situations, let's say you think about, let's say, airplane, right? Airplane, you only have one door, right? So your MRT only has one door, people will queue up, uh, have a long queue, the door open, and then people take time to enter the train, right? So that's the, that is if you have very small transition rate. So, so these two factors affect how long it takes to travel. And um it you no know, it, it it depends on the the how fast how fast the host can send depends on the link itself uh, and also depends on how much money you pay ist and so on and so on how long it takes for the packet to travel the propagation delay depends on the distance right so the packets will travel by speed of light or speed of electron and so the 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 higher the distance or, or the further apart the two holes, the longer the time it takes. All right. Our final point is that there are two protocols that we use to send things between two holes. There's a TCP and there's UDP. Now TCP is reliable. Whatever you send is guaranteed that you'll reach the other side, whereas UDP is not. And you will look at these two later. All right, so let's look at um, this graph over here. Um, this shows the x-axis shows the time. The y-axis shows the data received. So suppose somebody is uh, sending the data over, right? Uh, and then I keep receiving the data. And then the, 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 as the time pass, I receive more and more data, right? So you can see that this line is uh, increasing, right? This line is increasing, okay? So the slope of this line, the slope is basically uh, how fast you can send the data, 
of course, you can send the data. So this is the uh, basically the rate, the transmission rate, or the the, the throughput. Uh, how many bytes you can receive per second? Okay. So we'll come back to this a few times. Okay. Now this is another picture that shows. Uh, the sender is sending a bunch of stuff to the receiver. And um, if I send the same amount of data, this time here, right? So this is this is a time axis. This is time axis. This time here. This is um, how long it takes to send the data, right? Um, so once you send something, it will take some time to reach the receiver or destination. And this time here, this is how long it takes to travel. Okay. So this this picture just demonstrate the transmission delay and the propagation. Okay, so now let's um, let, let me talk about the um, Netflix or, or video on demand type of service. What do we do? Um, of course, to watch a video, you can download the file, right? Uh, download, save everything, and then you can watch it whenever you like. But when we talk about video on demand, uh, what we really mean is that you want to download the video while you are playing back or while you are watching the video. So let's think about how uh, this can be done, right? So you you this is this is like say the, the view of the player. So the, the player keep receiving video, keep receiving videos, and then uh, the player is playing back the video. Okay? So this is like two two different steps, right? One step is it, it receives video from the network. The other is that it takes whatever video data that it receives and then try to play it back. And these two are, are running concurrently at the same time. And it's like a, a race. Why is it like a race? Because as a video is being watched, right? The data, it, the, the, it keep consuming the data, right? Now, the, we want to make sure that we don't consume too fast. If we consume too fast, then there's not enough data coming in. Okay. Right. So we want to make sure that uh, we don't watch faster than the, um, the amount of video data that we receive. Okay. So what is this video data that I've talked about? Um, so again, a simplified view of what is a video, you, you have a bunch of pixels you capture from the camera, you compress them, and when you compress them, you compress the video at a certain bit. So you can compress the video at, let's say, one megabit per second. Right? Uh, so this means that uh, one second of video, one second of video file or video content, video clip, uh, takes about one megabit. Right? So you can encode with different bit rate. And of course, the higher the bit rate means that you use more bits to represent the data and therefore you have better quality. The picture is clearer, more details and so on. Right? So higher bit rate, better quality. So let's now revisit this picture. So just now I show you this is the uh, this is the data received, right? And if this is the this is the, the rate where I'm playing back the video, right? This is the rate I'm playing back the video, then I am fine because at any one time, right? At any one time, at any one time, the amount of data that I receive is more than the amount of data that I take. So I'm safe. 
right? So this is this is what what I want. Now the slope of this, the slope of this, um, is the bit rate where I encode the video. So if I encode the video with higher quality, then uh, the the red line will be steeper, right? If I encode with low quality, I use fewer bit to represent every second of this video clip, then the slope will be uh, less. Okay. So one way to look at this is that you now the, the rate of the video, right, is the less less than the rate of the network. Okay, then, then we are set. Okay, now this is the, the other situation. Now, if I'm greedy, I want better quality video, right? So I encode or I ask for video with highest quality or higher quality, the, the line will be deeper. And in this case, I can never play back because you know, I, I always need more bit to play back than the amount of data that I receive. Okay. So what can we do in this situation, right? So what, I can do is I will I can shift I can shift this line I can shift this line right so that my line my red line now falls below the black line okay. so remember red line is a, the the I'm playing at the video the black line is the data that I, that I received. So I can this, right? I can do this, right? So this, what this means is that if I want a higher quality video, I can still do it by uh, waiting at the beginning, right? So I click the video, I click play, but the video doesn't play immediately, right? So I have to wait, wait for you know, this video, there's some data to get downloaded, uh, download, 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 download. And then at this point in time, okay, and then uh, at this point in time, then I can you know, start to play back. And if I start playing back this time, I make sure that you know, so my red line falls below the black line, so I'm okay. okay. So this is what we call initial buffering. Uh, as you use YouTube or you do something else, you, you suddenly you click play, it doesn't start playing immediately. It will start playing after some time. And this is the reason. Right? Is that you have to wait for <clears throat> you know, the video to play. Now, sometimes you, you sort of, uh, you, you, you didn't buffer enough or you didn't wait long enough. Right. Now, if you didn't wait long enough, what happened? Right. You, you, you wait, 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 wait. And then here, okay, you start playing. Right. You start playing at this rate. So now as the data is still being received, you start to consume the data, right? You consume the data. Now you consume the data at the faster rate than the rate that you receive the data. So after some time, your red line will hit the black line. What does this mean? This means that you run out of data to play already. Right? You run out of data to play already, so how? You now have to wait for more data to come in until after some time, then you can continue playing the game. Okay. So, well, just now I said this is like buff initial buffering. This is what I call rebuffing. So sometimes you watch you watch a video and then you watch halfway and then it stop pause and then you see this thing spinning, 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 and then continue again. Okay. So this is this is what happened. So we want, um, we want the, we want the um, red line to always stay below the black line. But why, why would this happen? You might ask, right? Um, suppose I know how fast I'm receiving the data, and I know how, what is the bit rate of the video, right? 
then I can compute precisely how long I need to wait before I start paying back. Correct? Okay. So if I can compute this, then no, um, I should just wait at the beginning and not wait. I don't have to wait in the in the middle of the video at all. But this is of course the ideal case. And the ideal case is that you know, the network throughput, the, the, the rate they receive data is the same. In practice, uh, it looks something like this, right? Sometimes your network is faster, sometimes your network is slower. So, so maybe some, somebody else started another connection and then you have to share your, band, your Wi Fi bandwidth with somebody else and so on and so on. So, so there are many reasons, but no, your network throughput is never constant. It always go up and down. And when it go up and down, it becomes very difficult now to estimate how long you need to wait at the beginning. Okay. So um, when this happens, so these things can happen, you can wait, but um, if the network throughput suddenly drops, like what I show here, the, the, the black line suddenly become you know, less steep, um, then your red line will catch up, and then now you have to rebuffer again. You know, rebuffer after some point, and then you know, uh, you know, go up, then maybe you have to rebuffer another time. So, so in, in practice, this is, this is what, what will happen because we can never predict or estimate the future network conditions. So how do we solve this problem? Now, um, there is a standard called the MPEG dash um, a protocol for video streaming. And this is a protocol that is used by um, all the, the major network, uh, all the major video streaming companies like YouTube, uh, Netflix, uh, Apple, and so on. Now they might use something slightly different, slightly different protocol and so on, but the principles behind uh, are all the same, right? which, which I'm going to tell you about this. So what is uh, DASH? So DASH stands for Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. So let's take this apart, right? So streaming, we know, right? Streaming is you, you watch or you download. Let's look at over HTTP. So HTTP uh, is a protocol for web, right? Um, getting web pages, images, everything uh, over the web browser. But we can use HTTP for video streaming as well. And this is how we do it. If you have a video, or you have a two hour video, for example, we chop this video into small tiny files. We chop them into small tiny files. Let's say two seconds per file or per second. Okay. And then what the player does is that he just use HTTP get as a, as a web server or as a, play, uh, as a video server. Okay, now send me this file, send me this file. Next, send me this file, send me this file. Okay. They keep doing this. Okay. Now, um, because now your video is into small files, every files must be completely received before you can start playing back. Okay. But this is essentially what how, how we do video streaming over HTTP. Okay. Now, um, I want to show you a demo. I hope it works. Uh, Okay, now this is uh, Netflix and I show the window over here. Let me move this one up so that you can see. Okay, I'm going to play a video. Uh, don't worry, this is, I checked, this is a Creative Commons license, so I'm not directing any video here. Okay. Uh, it's not showing up. Okay, so now you see it's spinning. So this is initial buffering. 
and you can see all these get all this uh you no know, http get and take all oh, this oh okay. I forgot to switch that back. Okay, let me let me show you the, the good network condition first. Okay, so now you see all the all the gaps start to come in, right? Right. So this this shows that you no, know, when when you play the video, it's actually a lot and a lot of HTTP get requests getting sent. And uh, you're getting response back. Um, since I'm here, I might as well show you this. Uh, I think it's Control Shift Command D. No, Control Shift Alternate, alternate D. Yeah. So in, your, in Netflix, if you do control shift alternate D, you get something called uh, stats for nerds, right? for, for people like me, where I just look at what is the frame rate, what's the, how many frames, how many frames get dropped, uh, how many bytes, what, what is the size of the buffer, what, what is the so, so. so there are a lot of statistics here, right? Um, so if you're interested, you want to see what's going on under new Netflix, so do control the niche and you no, know, you can you know, look at all these uh, statistics. Okay. Um, let me now switch back to this. Okay, so I talk about um, over HTTP, right? So now let me talk about the first term, which is dynamic. So what is dynamic about, about this? So by dynamic, what we mean is that not only you take the video, you chop into like two second segments, you actually encode each segment into different bit rate, into different bit rate. Right. So let's say I, I take two seconds of this video and then I create multiple versions or multiple representations of this. The first one is highest quality, right? Uh, no, maybe two megabit per second. Next one is one megabit per second, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay. And by doing this, we allow the players to download and play segments at different bit rate or many different quality at different times. So take for example, I have a video I chop into two second segments, right? Every column. And then every segment I encode with different representation. Right? Representation. And then as a as a client playback this thing, um, you can choose different quality at different times. So for example, you can start with uh, one megabit per second, play the second one, one megabit per second. Then he started to increase three maybe per second, five megabit per second, and then go back to three and then zero point five, etc. Et et so you have this you know, flexibility of choosing um, different segment at a different degree. So now let me talk about the adaptive part. Now let's look at uh, this picture here. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to uh, try to annotate and explain it carefully. So let's imagine that I, I start to play back over here. I start to play back. And then, so no, I, 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 I click on the video, right? I haven't played that yet, I click on the video. And then I start to download the first segment. I download the first segment, and by the by the time I, I receive this, right, my first segment is done. 
right? Then I download the second segment. I download the second segment, but unfortunately my network becomes slower. Right? So it takes longer time for me to download the second segment. And I finish downloading the second segment over here. Okay. Now, based on the information available, maybe the player decides, okay, I want to start playing back the first segment over here. Right? So you start to play back the first segment. And so you you start to consume you start to consume the uh, data until at this point right so so remember this is the, the the amount of data for the first segment so after this I'm done with my first segment and then now I will continue playing back the second segment okay. but the 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 challenging point is what should we do at this point. Now, just now, first one, I, I download this. Second one, I download here. But now, I need to decide what to download, which representation to download. Okay. Now, at this point, I have to decide, uh, for example, I predict that my network will remain congested. Right? I predict that my network will, will follow this dotted line in blue over here. Will follow this dotted line in blue over here. Okay. And now I'm going to decide which representation I should download. Because this, the third representation is the third, the third segment that I'm going to play, right? And if I decide wrongly, let's say if at this point I decide I want to continue with the same representation, the same bit rate, the same quality, then then I would follow this line over here, right? I will follow this line over here. If I do that, then what happens, right? Uh, as I start playing back the third, third segment, I would run out of data. Right? Because I, I wouldn't have received this third segment, I, I would receive this third segment only at this point. Right? Because third segment takes this much amount of data and I can only download this amount of data at this point in time. So I cannot play back the third segment if I do that. Then I mean, I have to store. I have to have this spinning thing, right? So what I can do is now I downgrade my quality. I download something that of a slightly lower quality. Let's say I download this, right? Download this. And I can finish downloading this at this point in time. Oh, still not enough. Because as after I play back, my second segment, my third segment hasn't finished downloading yet. So I still cannot. Okay. Uh, let's, let's downgrade quality one more notch. Let's say I download this one, this quality, lower, lowest quality. And this is the amount of data I need to download. And I can finish downloading this one at this point in time. Okay, so now this works because now I can download the third segment, which will finish downloading here. And then um, when I need to play the third segment, I can start playing over here. So this means this ensure that I have continue, I can continuously play back my video without uh, repuffering. Okay. Any question? All right, so, so um, long story short, you look at your network condition, you estimate what's going to happen in the future, and then you adjust which one, which quality you want to play, which quality you want to play, right, uh, to ensure that you, your playback is uh, consistent, right? no but rebuffing. So this is the adaptive part. So dynamic adaptive training. The adaptive part is that you estimate the future bandwidth, then you decide, and then you need to carefully trade off between quality and buffer level. Of course, um, you, you can be conservative, but right? you always download the lower for lower quality. You always download the lower quality, then you, you, you ensure that you pay back is very small. Right? But then your, your 
you know, as, as a viewer, you want something of higher quality. But you have higher quality, then this means that there's a danger that your playback will stop. You have new buffering. So you have to carefully adjust between these two. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can show you a demo here. I hope, I hope this works. Network. Uh, I'm going to make this a slower network. Uh, I don't know. Let me try. Let me try to three. Uh, so you see, um, this line here, the the light gray. This is the video that has been downloaded. Right. So this is like my my gray line, right? This is like my gray line, my gray line until here already. This is my red line. This is where I have played that. Okay. So I can I can make Netflix panic a little bit. I jump to the front here. Uh, auto the bandwidth and now play. And what I'm hoping to see is uh Lower quality video. Let me jump into the video. Okay. okay, so you see, um, here I'm downloading something in the range of 500, 500, 500, 500, right? Per second. Here, you see, it goes on to 100, 100, 100, 100, 60 something. So even though you don't clearly see the difference in quality, we are actually downloading um, slower quality video as I uh, throttle the bandwidth. Okay. All right. Now let's go back to this. All right, so that's all I want to share about um, Netflix or, or video on demand. Now let's move on to the next um, application, which is video conferencing. Now, what's the difference between video conferencing or video on demand? For video on demand, your video is pre-recorded. Um, somebody record the video, put the video somewhere, or, and then you just download the video and watch. For this video conferencing, the video is being captured live, like on the camera here, being encoded and then sent. Right, uh, for, for the Zoom users to watch. Now, in terms of interaction, um, video on demand is just one way, right? You, you can't talk back to, to the whatever actor is acting on the show. But video conferencing, usually you are in a meeting, you talk to each other. Okay? In, now, when you talk to each other over the internet, there is a, a, a limit, a limit on the delay requirement. So people have studied this that you know if I if I talk to you face to face, right? Um, the delay is very small right, because it's a this peak of light. But if you go through the network and people start to increase this delay and study the effect. Above a certain threshold, uh, people will start to get annoyed by the delay. Uh, people will start to talk over each other. Right? It becomes not, um, not natural anymore. Okay? And that threshold is about 150 milliseconds one way or 300 milliseconds round trips. Whereas for for watching video online, there's actually no delay requirement. You can, you can maybe buffer for five seconds and then you can start to that, right? No issue. Now, in terms of packet losses for video on demand, we do it over HTTP, which runs over TCP. And so that's reliable. When you send something over HTTP, everything that you send will be received, right? guaranteed. Now, when you do video conferencing, uh, we are using something called UDP. And 
there's possibility of packet losses. Now, the last one that I list here is uh, in terms of connections. When you do video on demand, yeah, one video server and the multiple clients connecting to that downloading uh, video to watch. Whereas for video conferencing is uh, you go from the client to the server and back to the client. Okay. So let me um okay, let me turn of this. Okay, I want to I don't want to do it here. Okay, I want to start video okay, here. And I'm running a tool called Wireshark. And how many of you heard of Wireshark? All right, good. And many of you do. So I just want to show you what's happening here. So go to the connections. Okay, oh, this. Ah, zoom in slightly. I really don't know how to do that. Anyone know the shortcut in Wireshark to increase the font size? Uh, <laughs> uh, Sorry? Oh, view, zoom, ah, yes, yes. Great, fantastic. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the, the packet. And you can see that all these packets are packets that I'm receiving. Uh, it's on UDP on this port. And no, uh, I'm guessing 173.23.13. I think this is my com. Um, forgot the comment. Yeah, so this is this is me. Okay. So it means that this thing here, one one five nine dot two five one dot two seven dot one eight three. This is a zoom server. Let me Let's show you who this node is. One nine one nine eight two five one 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 dot two o seven dot Okay, so this is um, I can zoom in as well. This is a server owned by Zoom, and this is just one of contact. Okay, this, this is just a, a, a server owned by Zoom, right? So what we see here is that when we Zoom, actually the clients, right, talk to a server somewhere. And so this video doesn't directly send from here to my, to my laptop, 
right? Or, or, or to all of your home for those of you watching this elsewhere. Right? All these videos, my screen share, everything gets sent to a server. And then this server then reach to distribute them. Now, um, now let me show a demo to show you how fast uh, the end-to-end the, the -end delay is for Zoom. Okay? So I said the delay for me is about 150 milliseconds. Okay? So I'm trying to show this. I, I hope this works. So this is okay. So uh, it's out of focus, unfortunately. But what you see is that if I start to wave my hand, right, you sort of see this like the ray, ray in the mirror cave effect, right? Um, where I need to, I should off the, the chat message. So as I wave, right? So this this thing gets sent over to the to the server, right? And then uh, get sent back. Yep. So so you can you can see how how fast the the, the, the actual you know, delay is, right? So it it gets sent to the server and then gets sent back to my phone. Okay. So so you can see as I wave my hand, it, it, it takes less than a second. In, in fact, about 100 milliseconds. And I, the, it's, it's too blurry, it's too blurry to see here. But when I try it on, on my laptop, because I, I have this um, infinite recursive mirror effect, right? So you can actually count, you know, let's say you, you count two seconds, and then you, one second, then you see how many times my, my hands appear in one second. Then you divide that, you roughly get the, uh, the 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 end to end delay. Okay. So uh, zoom delay is is uh, really small, and if you think about it, it's it really very amazing what what they are doing. Right. So they are capturing, they are encoding, right. They are sending it up to the server. So there's already some network delay, and then on the server they have to. Distribute this to all the clients, give it to all the clients, and then the client to receive, have to buffer, decode, and then display. And everything within 100, uh, 150 milliseconds. Okay. Now, how did they do it? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll skip this. Now, how did they do it? Um, unfortunately, I don't know because. Um, many of their protocols are proprietary. Uh, but what I can tell you is if somebody built this with like open standards and open tools, uh, this is what they would do. Okay. Now, unlike previously, where we take the video, we charge in two seconds, right? We cannot wait for two seconds anymore. If you wait for two seconds, now your delay is, is way over 100 milliseconds. So what we have to do is now we have to work at the frame level, every video frame. Okay? Now every video frame is then encoded into a series of packets. And the, the standard for this is uh, what is called RTP or real-time protocol packets. These packets uh, get sent over UDP. Okay? And at the receiver side, again, I cannot afford to keep uh, too, too much uh, buffer, right? Things thing that come in, I cannot wait in the buffer for too long. Think packets come in, uh, as soon as I get the video frame, I should be able to you know, immediately decode and then display to keep the end-to-end -end delay small. Hmm? Now, in the case of, in the case of um, Zoom, or in the, sorry, in the case of MPEG Dash, the Client is the one that uses HTTP right, to decide which representation to download, because all the all the 
videos are all pre-encoded into different volume. In this case, uh, I'm, and I'm recording live. I, I, I don't have the luxury of pre-encoding everything. Okay? So the receiver has to send the feedback to the server says, okay, this is what I'm looking at. This is my network condition, etc." And then the server will then on the fly encode the video according to that requirement. So this is the, the difference between um, live video conferencing and uh, video on demand. Now, one thing uh, interesting that I want to add is that when we talk about live, there are actually two versions. One is with interaction. Imagine you have 10 meetings, right? People talk to each other. The other is like now, like our Zoom lecture. Most of the interaction is one way. Right? So if most of the interaction is one way, um, the delay requirement is actually smaller. Uh, it, it's really larger. You don't, you don't need like all of these 100 milliseconds uh, requirements. Okay? So um, just, to, just to show you this uh, subtle differences between like, online lectures and online meetings in terms of requirements. Okay. Now, I say that for Zoom, we actually can get packet loss. And again, let me show you some, uh, some stats for nerds. Um, statistics. Like if you go to Zoom preference, you can see this. Okay. So this tells you the bandwidth. Okay. Um, can go, let's say video, right? It tells you how many frames per second uh, is capturing and sending. Uh, we are not getting any packet losses, which is which is good. Right? And it tells me what's the resolution that I'm sending. Okay. Now you can see the latency for for sending is is uh, really really small. So you can you again just like the, the Netflix one, you can go in, click the statistic, and then you know have fun, try to see what is happening under the hood. Uh, sometimes if you're in a meeting, uh, your network connection is poor, and then you you, you know you keep hearing, uh, you keep losing the other parties what what they are saying and so on. You know, look at this and then see what what happening. So how can we deal with packet losses? Now, again, I don't know whether Zoom does this, but these are like standard techniques that we can use. Right? Um, one technique is called forward error correction. Now, normally when you have, when you send packet, let's say over TCP, right? It's reliable. So when the packet get lost in the network, uh, you just do retransmission. Basically, the receiver tells the seller, hey, I, I got everything, but I missed this packet. Please you know, resend this to me. For live conferencing, we don't have a luxury to do that because our end-to-end -end latency is so small. Okay? So we cannot afford to request and then resend. So what we have to do is we have to deal with the losses ourselves at the receiver. But one way to do this is for the sender to send an extra packet. Extra packet. Now this extra packet uh, is computed using some way. So one simple way is just to XOR. You take all your packets, right? You use XOR to compute this extra packet. And then in this case, I have six, I compute one, then I send this six plus this extra packet. If any of these six is lost, then you can use this, uh, X all you compute what is the bits in the packet that is lost. So you sort of recover, right? You sort of recover that, and then now no, you, you can play that. Okay. So this is what is called forward error correction. As is that you send you you predict that you know, things there will be an error, and then you you send this extra packet so that the receiver can correct it. 
There are other more sophistication, more sophisticated one, where even if you lost, let's say three out of five, you can recover. But then that's more expensive, more overhead, and so on and so on. Another one, another method is just to do error control. And you, I, I don't hear this a lot in Zoom, but if you do Teams or, or Skype, right? Sometimes you're, you lost the audio of the other person, and then you sort of hear some, some, something that sort of fill in the gap in the audio, right? So that's uh, what is called error consumer. So if you have some, let's say some audio signal here, and then there's some gap. So what they do is they try to, they do some signal analysis and then try to fill in uh, this signal in between, which might not be the exact, but at least you don't you don't hear like all the all the clicks and beep that are that are annoying. Right? Um, so this is another way we can deal with backup process. Now, in the worst case, you cannot recover, cannot conceal, then you just lose what the other person is doing. Right? Then you just do error recovery at the human level. Just say, can you please repeat that? Now, the other thing that we have to deal with uh, for video conferencing is delay jitter. And for delay jitter, basically, um, is, the, is, is, is due to the fact that in network, when you send a packet, uh, it might not take the same time to reach the destination because of congestions and so on, it might take longer. Okay? So, so um, in this example, like, uh, you can see the sending rate is the same, but the propagation delay now becomes longer and longer. So if you are if you're trying to keep your delay very short and you encounter a situation where the packets that the other party sent hasn't arrived yet, then what should you do? Uh, what the what we can do is we try to catch up. We try to catch up by playing faster. Now for audio, it turned out that um, as we speak, there's actually a lot of gaps in between words or in between sentences, right? It could be one second, two seconds. But um, this, this is enough for us to squeeze because we only need to squeeze down to 100 or five milliseconds, right? So if there are like tiny breaks between our words, the player can actually squeeze, like throw away the gap and then play back the next sentence, play back the next word. Uh, earlier, right? So to, to sort of try to catch up. For video, is uh, every is uh, frame by frame, and you can again, you know, try to play back the frame faster uh, to try to catch up the delay. Try to keep the delay back to the um, threshold again. And sometimes you see this, uh, you do conferencing with somebody, and then suddenly you freeze, and then suddenly you just, just, like, move very fast, right? So this is what happens. All right, so this is the final, final thing I want to mention. Um, the interesting thing about video conferencing things like Zoom is that it's capturing one video, but then different people will view it differently, right? So you might have a high, no, big monitor, or you might watch it on your phone, Oh, you might, you know, let's say my, even my lecture students don't want to see my face, they just want to see their friends, they can switch to gallery view, right? Um, so everyone can have a, a different, can view the video at different quality. Now what, then the question is, what quality should this, what quality of video should this user send? Now, of course you can say, okay, I take the maximum, right? There's somebody who wants to watch, you know, the video in high resolution, I just encode high resolution, send it to everyone. Now this is actually a waste of bandwidth because uh, for this user is good. For this, then you'll be receiving so many videos in, in high quality and it's going to, to, to congest up the network. Or another way is that let the sender send three copies of the video. Right? 
They send one that is high resolution, send one that's medium resolution, send one that's low resolution. All right. So that's okay, but now the, the sender has to send uh, more data. And the key point is that the if you look at the, the, the content of this video, they are a lot of repetition. Okay. So to be more efficient, we can reduce this repetition as we uh, uh, reduce the repetition with some clever technique. So this is uh, a technique called scalable video, scalable video. And what we do here is that we take the video and then we compress it in multiple bit rates, just like before, right? But now instead of multiple files, I just have one file. But I just encode the information differently. I encode it into, uh, in this case, into three, what we call layers, three layers. The base layer has a lowest quality, right? And then to encode something with medium quality, I don't just encode this independently. I encode the extra information that I need to go from base layer to this. Right. So one simple way to think of this is the following. You take this base layer, you scale up the quality, right? Then you 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 take the difference with this one, and then you send a diff. Right? So with the base layer plus a diff, then you can reconstruct this. Same thing, you can take base layer and layer one plus the diff then you can reconstruct it, right? So now you have this video, you encode one time, you encode into the, the most basic information plus the diff, plus the diff, plus the diff, different. And now our sender can just send the base layer plus, send the three layer to the server. And then depending on the requirement of the client, what, or what is it that they want to view, the, the server can just send off different layers to different users, right? So this is another trick that uh, Zoom is doing so that it can scale up to many users with uh, different viewing requirements. All right. Okay, so I'm reaching my, the end of my talk here. So I just uh, want to take the opportunity to so I'll share a little bit more about uh, what I do for research. So I talk about video streaming, right? Uh, my research is on video streaming, but I like to add some interaction on top of it. So interaction means <clears throat> battery. How about battery? Maybe. Hello, okay, it's, it's back on, all right. Maybe I press the button, okay. Um, so I like to add some interaction and this includes you know, things like zooming and panning, okay. You watch the video, you can zoom in to see more details or you can pan around, right. Uh, there is something called 360 degree videos that many of you might know, might see from Okay, just a second. So uh, you might seen this on on YouTube before, right? So you can play the video and then start playing again from the beginning, right? So this is real video, right? I hope none of you are, are scared of height. Um, 
right? So you can turn around, so you can zoom and pan. So this is 360 degree videos. Um, and you can watch this on the desktop or you can put it onto the head mounted display and move your head. Okay. Another example is um, well, like something like this where you, you can record the video and then as the video is playing, you can sort of change the viewpoint a little bit and look at, look at what, what is behind this, this builder, for example. Right, so you can do something like this. Right, so, so something to add more dimensions to just drag through these videos and use it. And it. So that's something that I, I'm working on uh, for, for my research. So how do you stream this? How do you compress? How do you uh, handle interaction with multiple users and so on and so on? All right. So I guess that concludes my presentation. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Yes, yeah. Uh, so that, that will be like uh, live streaming. Oh, yeah, the Zoom. Ah, okay. Yeah. So the, the question is for, for things like Twitch, right, uh, in what spectrum is so, so Twitch would be something like a uh, web lecture. So it's, it's live, but in one way. So your, your, your delay probably is like two, three seconds. You, it, it's still okay. You don't need uh, like a, a hundred milliseconds, 150 milliseconds. Okay. Right. And that, that is because there's still some amount of interaction in terms of, let's say, chat or, 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 or clicking emo emoji and so on in this type of uh, thing. So if there's any other question, we can just pass you the mic. Uh, there's, a, there's a Zoom question that asks, I'm really curious, what more should I learn to build a particular design? Real time to make it. Ah. Okay, uh, interesting question. So we have something called CS2108, Introduction to Media Computing. That one talks a lot about, uh, um, that's about video, video audio representation in general, right? CS2108, it might cover one or two lectures on video streaming. Uh, and then we have uh, CS5248. CS5248 is a master level course but it requires only like uh, 205 as a prerequisite. And for that one, you will learn about like Dash and so on. Or, so, so, and I think about multimedia systems and stream. So that is like the, 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 the most you know, appropriate course for this question. Yes, yep. So there's five. another question yeah. from Zoom, which is, are Raptor codes already implemented for streaming and video conferencing? Uh, Raptor code. Uh, I'm not aware. I'm not aware that Raptor. So Raptor code is is kind of something similar to to like forward error correction, where you you take a bunch of packets, you encode it, you send that coded message, and then even if you lost something, you can uh, recover. Um, I'm not aware, and I'm not sure whether uh, whether it is fast enough. I, I've I've seen papers that that claim they do this, but. Uh, I haven't seen it in like real real systems. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, um, sorry, like, with my mask on. Uh, so uh, I was just wondering, like, if Zoom is communicating through like UDP protocol, then it is not end to end encrypted, right? Then everyone in the same Wi-Fi network can see what is going on in the Zoom. Mm, okay. Uh, Zoom encryption is uh, so UDP is just the the network the, the transport layer protocol. Uh, the encryption, I believe, is done at the application level. So. You, you take the video, you compress it, and then you now encrypt the video before you put it into UDP to send. Okay. Now, um, one thing, uh, so, yeah, so go ahead. So it is called HTTPS, but it's still SSL. 
No, so, sorry, I didn't get a question. So it is not HTTPS, but it is still SSL, is it? HTTPS. Okay, for, for Zoom, uh, the, the demo that I show is actually running over UDP, not HTTP. Yeah. Um, actually, I want you to add that uh, UDP doesn't work for all the networks. So for example, some firewall might block UDP packets, right? Our, our network doesn't, as you see, but uh, some company they bought UDP packets and so on. So Zoom actually has actually a lot of application, has some sophisticated way to decide how to uh, how to what protocol to use, basically. So they can choose UDP with it. So if UDP doesn't work, they might have to switch back to TCP. Right? Uh, if TCP certain port is blocked, they might go to HTTP. But HTTP go go through every port. Right, so they might go, they might do, you know, um, switch between different protocol. But of course, at certain cost, like if you go HTTP, then uh, it will be uh, more overhead. But for encryption, I, I believe it's, it's done all at the uh, at the application level. Yeah, Prof, just one last question before we end your section of the talk. So. Uh, there's a question on Zoom that asks, what's your take on neural codex? Ah, good question. Neural codex. So neural codex is basically, uh, you try to encode the video uh, using neural network. Right, so, so for example, uh, the, the center side has one, has one uh, network. The like, network is not, not computer network, neural network. The decoder side has, has one network. You, you push in the, the video, it, you outcome a feature vector, then you send this feature vector across. On the other side, you just take this feature vector, you generate back the video or generate back the image. Right? So that's the uh, neural codec. Now, what's my take on it? Uh, I, I see a lot of research papers on this. I've seen people that use this to sort of recover from errors and they can do it uh, very, very fast. I know that is the MPEG, which is a standard organization that look into standardizing some of this uh, codec that is based on neural network. So I think there's a future on, on this. Um, it's because I, if you look at the evolution of compression techniques in the last 30 years. They are all based on the same underlying technology, which is something called discrete cosine transformation. Okay. Um, it's just more and more sophisticated versions and so on. So this neural network compression is sort of a whole new paradigm. And I think that uh, is a, a fertile ground for, for innovations in coming up with uh, uh, better codec in the for the future. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, hi guys. Uh, thanks, bro, for the talk. Um, and thanks, guys, for the questions. Um, and yeah, we'll be concluding this part of the session now. So, uh, thanks, everyone. Um, we'll be. Yeah. Uh, so we'll be taking like a three minutes break while Omar, our next speaker, um, sets up uh, on Zoom. So unfortunately, Omar was unable to come down uh, physically today due to some um, some issues that he had to address. So he'll be joining us via Zoom. For the people um, at the physical venue, we'll be playing it on here. Um, yeah, so Omar will just be setting up in a few minutes. So if you guys need to use the washroom or anything, please feel free. All right, thank you everyone and uh, thank you for having me.
Hey guys, can you hear me? Oh. Yeah. Great. Oh, wait, can you try again? It's a bit soft. It's all. Uh, can you hear me this time? Yeah. Okay. That's great. That's great. One, two, three. Just let me know if it's too soft. Uh, I'll okay. shout. Okay. That's good. That's good. All right. Great. Uh, okay, guys, uh, we'll begin in one minute. Uh, okay, I think we're ready to start now, um, Omar. So, uh, All right. Okay, so let me just uh, briefly introduce the session. So um, this uh, so this talk will be by uh, Omar. He's a core team alumnus. He's given a lot of talks at Friday Hacks and Engineers.sg um, before, and he is currently the lead engineer at Buya. So I've had the pleasure of working with him before. Um, he's a great person, gives great talks. So yeah, I'm really excited for this talk. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jivesh. Uh, those of you who don't know, Jivesh is also a pretty great intern. He was working quite closely with me on the video stuff, actually. So uh, before I begin, I must introduce myself briefly. Uh, so my name is Omar. As Jivesh mentioned, I'm the engineering lead for the Booyah project. Uh, those of you who don't know what Booyah is, I'll just give you guys a very, like, just show you guys what it is. Basically, it's, it's a live streaming platform that we are building. So it might look similar. So it looks like Twitch. So it is basically quite similar to Twitch. Uh, it's a live streaming platform designed for um, mobile games, but mobile games primarily. So we also have mobile app. We also have a mobile app. Uh, it's kind of the, the motivation for this product comes from Free Fire, which is a game that, that Karina publishes. So a lot of the streaming content is from Free Fire and we're expanding to other kinds of content as well. Uh, we are actually, we launched this project last year uh in 2020 and since then we've seen some pretty good growth uh right now we are primarily in markets like brazil uh, latin america uh, middle east india and uh, vietnam and indonesia actually in brazil we are one of the after youtube we are the second highest uh, in terms of ccu for free fire streams at least so it's it's a project that's growing quite fast and just like before I go on any further, uh, we are hiring. So we are hiring for interns. We are hiring for full-timers. So if you guys find any of this stuff interesting or anything that the prof talked about interesting, that's that would be super good because uh, that's exactly the kind of problems that we deal with. I think Jivesh will share, might my, 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 my be, might share some experiences with you guys, but basically he dealt with a similar player issue where how do you, how do you recover from player errors, for example. So if you're, if you're interested in video or video tech streaming at all, or how does Twitch do streaming, or how do you do low latency live streaming, versus, uh, uh, or how do opt, how do you optimize for these things? This is like like this is the perfect kind of place for you to join because that's what we're building from scratch. Okay, uh, I'm gonna jump to the talk now. So today's talk isn't gonna be that much about live streaming. Uh, Prof did a really good job of covering pretty much a very wide landscape of uh, especially the theoreticals. So what I'm gonna focus more about is a slightly different topic, which is a more about observability. Uh, and this is a more broader topic. Uh, it's, it applies to software engineering in general. So, and especially in production systems. So when you're dealing with production fires, uh, this is the thing that'll save you or, or not save you if you don't do it right. So uh, what do I mean by that, right? So I'm gonna ask you guys a question first, which is, how do you debug in production, right? 
like like so so if you have a production issue happening uh, right, right now for example something is down users are complaining how do you how do you approach it right so and when you're in university uh, or or when you're uh, doing your school projects the answer is hey debugger right let's put a debugger on it <laughs> that makes sense uh, the problem is that debuggers don't really work for production right so if you're working on a client side application uh, debuggers can only be attached to devices you own right and the, the and you can only reproduce bug you can only use it to, to fix bugs that you can reproduce on your device and which is sadly a very small minority of bugs uh, that are actually out there in the wild right so that means like you judging a debugger if you if you can't reproduce something you won't be able to fix it and you can't just tell your customers that oh I can't reproduce it, so sorry, F off. Like, we can't do that, right? We have to solve problems for, for customers, no matter, or, or for users, no matter we can reproduce them or not. So like some examples of this, like some, some stories, right? So, so you, we might have some old Android versions running on some very old OEMs or very old like Android devices, which do funky things in the kernel that, that may not make certain hardware components available, for example. So that, that particular issue only occurs on that particular device shipped in a particular region shipped like let's say in, in brazil they might have some samsung model that has a weird video codec for example and that can't play back videos that are coded with h264 level 5 for example and so these kind of issues they're very very hard to debug how do you even know how do you how do you even find them right similarly another interesting issue that we've faced before uh you might have, if you have a website, for example, and you want to put your website inside a mobile web page, uh, and you pull up, or you want to put it in a web view, like inside another app, like Facebook or Google or Facebook or YouTube or whatever, or like those applications might do weird things with, with the web view, and that may cause some problems. But a general broader philosophical problem with this approach is that, uh, with debuggers especially, is that using a debugger can impact the result. So especially if you have something that's timing sensitive. So debuggers are actually quite heavy. If you think about how a debugger works, normally they, you, they do a bunch of runtime hacks to, make, to, to be able to trap instructions and do, so, you, so that you can pause the state and stop everything where it is. And then you can look at variables and whatnot. All this requires, uh, the, the, requires a certain runtime, which is going to be quite different from your production runtime. And therefore, you can't reproduce issues that only happen in production using a debugger. Especially on client, uh, especially like less true on client side, but even more so true on server side. So if you're working on server side where performance is critical, uh, you you can't just put a debugger on a server, right? Because that server has to handle traffic. So the debuggers have a huge performance hit. So if and and if you have tens of thousands of servers, isolating the problem to one machine or one process is not that simple. We have thousands of servers running, and if you want to. Let's say if a problem is happening, how do you even find which server it is that you want to debug? Similarly, uh, the problem that you're facing may not be, may, it might be due to some middleware or it might be due to some database, Redis, a cache, uh, some message queue, whatever, some external dependency, and you might not have control of it at all. So, like, like, so, you, so, so based because of all these things, just using a, you can't just simply use a debugger basically, right? So what do you do next? It's quite simple. It's the good old way, right? So you just use printf. So you printf debugging, right? So uh, the key idea is that logs, logs are an engineer's best friend, right? So, and the way I think about it is a log is a snapshot of your internal state over time, right? So if you if you do your logging well, you have a history of what your state looked like. And, and with that, you can piece together the story of what went wrong. So logging is absolutely critical to finding issues. and you, you as, as an engineer, uh, especially working on production systems, it is very, very important to work and to work with a good logging library or framework to make sure that we are doing logging correctly. This usually means having things like log levels, so debug, info warning, et cetera. So you can filter out messages based on the log level that you're interested in. Uh, the log messages should be structured, should be easy to parse, especially true for server side, uh, because you, if you want to be able to query logs in, 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 a, in, in a nice way, you will want to structure them. Usually we structure them as JS JSON messages, for example, so that we can, we can do more advanced queries later on. Uh, and obviously, ultimately logging must, must be performant. 
if you have millions of log messages being produced every few minutes, like, like you don't want this to be slow. This, this by itself can become a bottleneck. So uh, given that, right? So if we think about logs in that way, uh, how can we achieve logging in a kind of scalable way, especially on server side? So because you imagine if you are logging to STD out or you're logging to a file, this, this obviously cannot scale, right? If you have, once again, hundreds or thousands of machines uh, and you're just storing logs locally, that is, it's going to be super hard for you to find any issue. First, you have to find the machine that had the problem. That'll take a while. By the time you locate the machine, then you can go to the machine and then you say, oh, okay, let me search for this log. Or you might need to do an ON search through all the machines to find oh, which machine had the problem. So this obviously won't work either. You need a centralized mechanism to be able to search logs efficiently. And ideally, ideally, it would be great if you could analyze logs. So for example, if you could have a histogram, right? You search for a log message, you could have a histogram of, of the, the occurrences of this over time, for example. That way you can, you, can, you, can, you can think about, you can find patterns and then that'll help you solve problems. So given all these requirements, how do we, come, how do we build a system that helps us do this, right? And one of the things that, one of the things that we use in production is this thing called uh, ELK. Uh, it, it's, uh, ELK stands for uh, Elasticsearch Logstash and Kibana, in, uh, or ELK. You can see the, the, cute, the cute ELKs here because of that. So uh, they call it the ELK stack. Cute, cute, Nick, cute joke there. But, but so, so what is, so we normally use this setup and let me just explain briefly what this is about. So the general idea inside this whole setup is you use this, you use a message queue or something to send log messages from different servers, and then you combine them together in the centralized ELK cluster. That's the key idea, right? So what you need is a strong message queue mechanism that is that, that provides your production level guarantees that your messages will be sent uh, at, a certain, at a certain guarantee. And uh, what we normally use in production is this thing called Kafka. So Kafka is a very, industry standard message queue implementation. What will happen is each server will actually send Kafka messages to a Kafka cluster. Uh, so these are producers. And then the ELK cluster, cluster will kind of consume those messages from that Kafka cluster, okay? So uh, very small diversion. I'm gonna just introduce Kafka slightly because some of you may not be familiar with it, but basically, uh, yeah, brief diversion into Apache Kafka. So Kafka is, this message queue system, like I mentioned, and the key concepts inside Kafka are, you have this concept of a producer, a consumer. Uh, so a producer will produce messages and you can queue them inside. A consumer will consume the messages from the producers to, to basically then use them later on downstream. Uh, one of the things is you can actually group messages by topics. So that's what topics are about. So basically you can have a topic for stats, for example, you can have a topic for logs, you can have a topic for stream service logs, for example. Uh, and uh, so this is a logical grouping, totally up to you how you want to define it based on your application needs. And finally, you can have a part, you have this thing called a partition, which is a very smart concept. So the way Kafka is able to scale so well and provide these guarantees is because it has this idea of partitions where actually we'll partition these queues across multiple machines. So we can scale Kafka horizontally by adding more machines. So if we, if we need to support a much larger message throughput, we just add more machines and the partitions will balance over those machines basically. So for example, if you, in this example, let's say you have, you have a client one, which is a phone, phone, which is a phone and your client two, which is a car in this case, which is cool. And what, what you wanna do is you wanna send messages uh, in these different queues. They may go in different partitions. So if you have uh, certain guarantees, you can kind of have some say in which partition you will go. If you don't have certain guarantees and you're okay with messages not being strictly ordered, uh, Kafka will do the partitioning for you. And this is a very, uh, so this is a pretty nice uh, and scalable implementation and it helps kind of, so we, we, we use it a lot. We use it for a lot of different use cases internally. We use it for stats, we use it for logging, we use it for a bunch of different things, uh, including things like uh, DB bin log parsing to do cache invalidation, et cetera. So it, it's quite a fascinating thing and it's very heavily used in the industry. Okay. If you want, guys want to learn more about Kafka, uh, there is this very cute uh, comic book that this guy came up with. So uh, it's it. So so whenever I read about Kafka, I always get confused about what what does what. 
And this all this nice comic strip helps me to remember. So if you like cute animals like otters, just just you can you can go here and give it a, give this give this link a try. So this will basically this is a very gentle introduction to Kafka. Just search for Kafka gently down the stream. You'll see you'll see it, and this will give you a much better understanding than what I have been able to give. So this is a sample. Uh, this is a sample of the explanation. So uh, they will they explain things in terms of otters and fam and a family of otters. So, so but, but anyways, I recommend reading this if you guys want more information on Kafka. Okay, right. Uh, moving on. So then after you have your Kafka thing, right? So you, you have your message queue implementation and you're able to send messages to Kafka. Then what you need is you need some, you need the centralized ELK cluster to actually uh, handle all these messages and be able to use them, right? So what ELK does for you is, uh, and the primary components in ELK are, this thing that beats thing that handles the ingest, uh, this log stash thing that basically that enriches your logs. These two are not that important. The main important thing inside the ELK cluster is actually Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is this very fascinating project that does very efficient text search at scale. And we use it quite heavily for logging and several other use cases. So we have this Elasticsearch cluster over here that will actually take all these messages uh, it will store them efficiently and index them so you can search them quickly. And then finally, you'll have this front end called Kibana where you can actually query and do your queries. So I'll show you, show you guys, like this will all become a bit more clear in a bit. So Elasticsearch, like I mentioned, is this uh, distributed and, and, and search and analytics engine. And under the hood, it uses this thing called Lucene, which is, uh, which is just kind of an old project. It, it, it's a designed for full text search basically. So the key idea in Elasticsearch is it will consume JSON documents. So these JSON documents could be like I mentioned, log messages or whatever, any, any JSON data structure basically. And based on those data structure the documents, it will actually produce these indexes, which is what makes the searching fast. So it has a, it provides you a REST API where you can actually call a simple REST HTTP API and you can actually conduct, you can actually uh, do fairly complex queries, which will run very, very fast. Remember, text search is actually quite quite slow. Can be quite slow if you don't index it correctly. And this is the hard problem that Elasticsearch solves quite well, and especially at scale. So Elasticsearch, the, the key difference between Elasticsearch and Lucene is Elasticsearch is basically distributed Lucene, and it does, and it's highly available. And this is something that we've experienced in production. So we had this interesting problem where one of our, we have a pretty big Elasticsearch cluster with I think twenty nodes. One of the nodes had a networking issue. And what happened was we, we thought our, our, search, our search feature went down for a little while, but then it recovered by itself because Elasticsearch can do recovery by itself. Uh, basically the nodes will do an election, they'll elect a new leader and then they'll, they'll, do, they'll do some transfer and they'll transfer the data that was lost over. Uh, they, have a, they have this thing called shards, et cetera, that I won't, I'm not gonna dig too much, too deep about, but it's a fascinating project. And I recommend you guys to go deep, dig deeper into it. Okay, uh, finally, uh, the final is this. So this is the front end, right? So this finally, we come to the place where we can finally read our logs. So this is what Kibana looks like. Kibana is this web project that allows you to uh, do queries on your logs. So, you, I, so for example, here I'm doing a query for all the 500s that happened in the last few minutes, for example. And uh, here, here, basically you can do, you can construct some, they have a query, lang query language that can do fairly sophisticated queries, which is quite awesome. And not only that, you can do, so you can, you can see, obviously you can see the histograms and stuff, which is quite nice. We can actually do much more advanced things as well. So you can use Kafka Kibana for building graphs, for example, or, or so, so, in, so in this case, what we do is uh, we, so we, because we, we are a live streaming platform, one of the things we need to do is we need to make sure our ingest is okay. That means the streamers pushing streams to us, that, that bit rate is stable. And we need to make sure that, that the network quality from the, from the streamer to us remains good and everything in the pipeline is working correctly. So this is what we use it for. So for example, over here, what you can see is uh, these lines here represent different streams. So just now Prof showed you guys, right? So actually what normally live streaming product, uh, systems would do is they would transcode a stream into different bitrate variants. So over here, you can see we have three different variants. The green line is the original stream and the other lines are the different bitrate variants, one 1080p, one 720p, one 480p. And what we can see here over here is there's a weird, there's a weird dip that happened uh, for, for the 1080p stream especially. And, and uh, this will be interesting because this, this could point to a possible problem in transcoding. 
because the original stream is okay, but the transcoded stream had some issue, it seems. So this is, this is looking at this, we can investigate and see, oh, okay, this stream might have had some issue. Let's investigate the transcoder next to see what could have possibly caused this, for example. So, so, so this is the kind of analysis that you can do with tools like tools like Kibana because, because yeah, it's, it's quite a rich tool. So, uh, so that's so, yeah, so that's, that's all about logging and, and, and some basic analysis. But another question that often comes is, okay, that's nice. Uh, how do we do monitoring though? Right, so how do we uh, how do we set up our monitor? How, how do, so let's say we have certain metrics that we want to look at. How do we monitor and make sure these metrics are doing well and take action if you know something is wrong in the metrics? So uh, in production level applications, so if you work on a production level system, they can have tons of metrics, right? So you can have uh, these your some business level metrics like oh your API success QPS for example or API failure query per second or your API latency, or your CCU, for example. Or you can be something a bit more low level, like you want to know a particular machine's CPU, network disk, IO, network IO utilization, or you want to know your, your storage QPS, for example, your MySQL or your Redis QPS, or you want some other deployment metrics, like how many Kubernetes pods you've deployed, uh, and, uh, or, or how many Kubernetes nodes you have, for example, right now, et cetera. So, so there's tons and tons of metrics that you may want to look at. Uh, at, at, at any point in time, and we need a we need a good way to basically be able to manage these metrics and be able to visualize them in, in an easy way. And the thing that the thing that we use is this uh, thing called Prometheus. So Prometheus is this uh, another very industry favorite system that basically provides. So Prometheus is basically a time series database. And it provides a multi-dimensional data model that basically allows you to do certain kinds of queries very efficiently in real time. And it's designed for metrics, basically. It's a very efficient database for metrics, essentially, if you think of it this way. And they provide a very efficient query language for you to be able to um, take, take, take advantage of this, basically. So I'll give a very brief example of Prometheus. So just so you guys get a brief idea. Uh, but here's an overall kind of architecture of what the things would look like, right? So if let's say you have a Prometheus setup, so you might have a Prometheus setup, Prometheus server, you might have certain, you might have your uh, targets, like so you might have certain services that are always there, for example, that these are, and Prometheus will pull metrics from these services, or you might have some short-lived services that will push metrics to Prometheus. And then Prometheus basically will, will take those metrics, it will store them in the internal time series DB, which will store them on, on the hard drive. And it also exposes an HTTP interface for you to do, do your queries using this uh, PromQL thing. And it can have, and you can render the results in Grafana or whatever other system. And you can also set up some alerting. So if you want to fire alerts, you can set up some alerts. And that's what, and actually we, so we use this whole thing. We love Prometheus. We have like several Prometheus clusters for doing several things. And we, we are big, big fans of Prometheus. So uh, here's a very simple example. Uh, like, like, so just to see how, I'll show you guys how we would use Prometheus. So here you can see what we're doing here is we are creating a, what's called a Prometheus counter. So here, well, the aim of this exercise is imagine we want to count how many requests happened. And we also want to group these counts by the method, HTTP method, that was whether it was get or post and by the URL and by the HTTP return code, whether it was a 500 or a 200, et cetera. So we will have these different uh, kind of uh, labels that we want to attach to this to, to this counter, right? So it's not just a simple counter that always goes up. It's, all, it's a counter for all these different permutations of these different labels, right? So we want to see, for example, this request that went to this URL with status code 200, with, that was a get, what was the count of this thing? This is what we want, we want to measure. And the way you would do that is very simple. So this is all the code you need, you need to do to do that. So, where you, so you set up this thing called, called a counter, and then you basically will increment this counter and you provided the label values that you need. And then what will, what will happen is uh, basically Prometheus will expose an interface. So this, this thing, they will expose this uh, metrics endpoint for, the, for, for Prometheus, this your Prometheus server to pull these metrics. And these metrics will be exposed like this. So there'll be a help that'll explain what the metric does. There'll be a type that explains what's the name of this thing. And it's like, in this case, the type is a counter. And in this case, this is what the, this is what it actually, this is what it'll actually look like. So in this case, for example, you can see I had 
1,234 counts where of this method get with code 200 with this URL. And this can be quite long. So, so this, this can be quite huge depending on your application, right? So, so this is a very useful uh, kind of way to get metrics together. And like, so, so, uh, and you can perform very sophisticated queries based on this. I'm not gonna go too much into detail for PromQL, but basically this is a, uh, this is a pretty rich query language that you can do, you can, you can actually do all kinds of different mathematical operations to, to, to find out things, different things. Uh, finally, uh, so, so we, in order to visualize all this, right, because you need a visualization for all this stuff, uh, we use this thing called Grafana. So Grafana is this, uh, is this project. I'll do a very quick demo so you guys get an idea. So because they have a very nice demo actually. So, so Grafana, for example, is a very nice uh, tool that will actually render these beautiful graphs that you can use to monitor, do, to basically render all these metrics that you have. So in this case, for example, let's say you are measuring client page load, for example. So you can actually draw some graph like this to see, oh, every, every five minutes, this is what my page load speed is like. Or if you want to measure your QPS, for example, this is, you can, you can actually do it this way. You can, you can split it up by different servers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's a pretty rich thing. And if you, if you want to know how it works, actually what's happening under the hood is you will just, you can, you can actually uh, set it up to do Prometheus queries. So, so, you, so if you want, if you have some Prometheus queries, let's say, for example, I have some query like this, uh, some, some, this is a Prometheus metric, for example. So hit this, I can write some prompt QL queries like this, for example. So here, for example, let's say I want to sum up all these alert alerts, this alert metrics, or if I want to do some rate operation on them, I, I can basically do all these different things. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but basically it's, it's a fairly flexible system for you, for you guys to be able to do render all this in a nice pretty graphs. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna to move to the interesting part. So let's say, okay, so all this is great, right? So we have uh, these metrics, we have metrics, we have logging and all this is quite good. And all this is pretty good for systems that we control, right? Which is awesome. But the problem is that often there are problems that happen on things you don't control or on software that you don't control. Uh, like what if you want some lower level monitoring, for example, kernel level monitoring or, or OS level monitoring. How do you, how do, you do that, right? Uh, so one of the things that we use in, in quite, a, quite heavily in our, in, our, uh, in our systems is this thing called a node exporter. So node exporter is this, is this uh, project uh, that actually exposes a ton of Prometheus metrics uh, for you to analyze. Uh, if you want to analyze a particular machine or a particular node, it'll expose all these different uh, metrics for you. So I'll show you guys an example in a bit of what it looks, what it might look like. But uh, here's an, uh, let me show you an example first actually. So what this might look like. So uh, let me still open our Grafana and show you guys an example. So uh, give it some time to load. It's quite, it's quite heavy. Yeah, so. So here's, a, here's an example, right? So here's an example of a node exporter, for example. So in the last one hour, we can see a ton of metrics on this particular machine. We can see CPU utilization, system load, uh, disk usage, uh, et cetera. So all our basic metrics, one of the things that we're interested in is CPU by core because sometimes single threaded applications can block on one core and you wanna find out what that happens. Uh, the thing that I'm gonna share next about is uh, something, uh, I'm gonna go a bit low level on the Linux networking stack because that's my, uh, I, I love talking about networking. So, uh, so, so, so we faced an interesting, we, we faced several interesting problems because we were dealing with live streaming and live streaming is quite networking heavy. Uh, we faced several interesting problems in networking. So this was an interesting issue we were debugging with a, debugging a few days back. So the context here is, so this is our, uh, this is the node exporter, for example, for a particular, on a particular machine. Uh, this machine was running uh, NSQ, which is a message queue as well. And what we observed on was that under very high load, we were having a huge number of timeouts when uh, basically when, when, when our load was high. And we couldn't find any errors on NSQ. We couldn't find any errors on our side. So definitely it's a lower level kernel level problem, right? So what's going on? Uh, so we wanted to dig into that, right? 
And what we observed is, so if you look at the network stats over here, for example, one thing you can see here is uh, this red line here is the total number of TCP connections, TCP sockets that are actually allocated. And you can see there was a sharp increase. This is due to the load test. But what we also noticed is that this green line and blue lines are retransmi retransmissions. We also noticed that when you increased the sockets, there was a huge spike in TCP retransmissions, which is, which is interesting. And which would also explain why we saw timeouts because the way TCP works is if it can't send a packet, it will retransmit it based on a timer. And if your timeout is less than the retransmission, you'll miss the retransmitted packet and you'll just time it out. Normally for, because we are within the same IDC, the timeout will be quite, quite short. That was causing our timeout. So we, we found the first problem. Okay, the timeouts are being caused due to retransmissions. Something is going wrong, definitely. Something is wrong in the Linux kernel TCP stack. So the next question was, okay, what, what went wrong? What could have, what happened when the load was high? So what we, what we did was then we looked at the TCP, we looked at the TCP, we looked a bit at the TCP implementation, right? So we tried to think, okay, what, what can go wrong? So what happens is if when you have a sudden, when you suddenly have a surge of a very large number of connections, TCP has this thing called, a, so what, well, the way a TCP connection is established is you need to send a SYN packet first, right? So you send a SYN packet, then, uh, then the other guy will send a SYN act, then, then, and then you have, so you have this three-way handshake, right? So while you send a, after you send a SYN packet, you are in a certain, you are in a queue internally inside the Linux kernel. So it has these two different queues, one's a SYN queue, one's an accept queue internally. The problem that happened for us was that we, that we came up, that we came to realize was that our default TCP stack parameters, the queues were too small. And what that causes is it'll cause the kernel to drop packets. And that is what we were observing over here. So the kernel was dropping packets, which is why they were retransmission spikes. And so, so, so the root cause of the problem was our network stack wasn't configured correctly for this kind of load. And we fixed it by tuning those TCP parameters. That was the, that's, that's the, that's the end, end lesson. But the key idea here is that this was a pretty low level issue. You can't debug this and an application level metrics. You need these kind of low level metrics, right? From the, from the system. And over here, these TCP metrics that Node Exporter uses are actually, it actually uses uh, kernel, level, kernel level metrics that are available. So, it'll, so this are, a, lot of the, a lot of the metrics here are based from Netstat, basically. So we run Netstat, which if you guys are familiar with, is this tool that's provided by Linux. Uh, and Netstat will give you these summaries, basically. The problem is that, so, so, and, and there are different tools for different things. So if you guys like low, your low level stuff, and if you guys want, are interested in this kind of, this kind of low level kernel level, kernel level optimizations, there are different tools for different uh, parts of, this, of the system, right? So if you have a machine, right? And there, are, and so if you, so if you, have, a, if you have a machine, uh, there are many different subsystems. There's the CPUs, there's, there's your CPUs, there's your network stack, your device, your hardware, uh, application layer, your file systems, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole ton of things. And there are different tools to analyze different, uh, all these different aspects. And most of the time, uh, the system, the tools provided on the system are usually enough for you to be able to get some idea, but sometimes it's not. So in this case, for example, we're looking at TCP stack, right? If you're looking at broad overall TCP stack metrics, Net Linux provides those quite well using Netstat, for example. Uh, but the problem is uh, if you want to go a bit deeper, right? Let's say, for example, you want to monitor retransmissions for per IP address, right? You wanna see how many retransmissions happen for a single connection. And then I wanna group that by some, something, let's say by ASN or something to see, hey, why is this particular network weaker than other networks, for example? You can't really do that out of the box. You need to build something for that. And this is not simple. Now you're going into, uh, now you need to modify the kernel somehow. So how do you do that, right? And that's where this thing comes in. It's called uh, extended Berkeley packet filter, EB EBPF, right? So EBPF is this, uh, so, so before I go into EBPF, I need to explain something a bit more about the Linux kernel. So inside, so when you run, when you're running anything on Linux, right? There's this concept called user space and kernel space. So let's say you have a process, right? Uh, let's say your process is, let's say reading and writing from a file or reading and writing from the network, right? What you're gonna do, end up doing is you're gonna have these read, write, sys calls ultimately, no matter what programming language you use, no matter what you're doing, no matter what library you're using, under the hood, everything, every any I/O you do will end up being a read or write syscall. A syscall is is, the, is this interface provided by the OS, and what will happen is the OS will then call its implementation for how to handle that syscall. And under the hood, what that will do is 
the OS, or a syscall normally will have this thing called a file descriptor, which describes the kind of thing you're writing to or reading from. This could be a file, it could be a network, it could be a socket, socket or whatever. So let's say, let's say it's a file. Then in this case, the system knows it has an implementation of a file system. So it knows how to, how to handle that file. It also will have a device driver to talk to your storage device, your actual device, your actual hardware device. This is, so, so it'll talk to the device driver to actually do the actual block saving, for example. And whatever internal caching there's needs to do to boost performance, all this is handled by the kernel, okay? And you really don't have much, much control here. Similarly for a network, because we're interested in networking, it's very similar. You'll have this thing called sockets, which is a kernel level abstraction. Uh, you'll have your TCP IP stack that's implemented inside the kernel. And then finally, you'll talk to your network device, your NIC, using the network hardware. Very similar idea, right? But if you, but in our case, we want to intercept this, right? So what we want to do, in, like I mentioned, we want to measure retransmissions by IP, right? That's something that I, that I, that I would be quite interested in because I want to know which, which users are having bad network and what's, how bad are they, right? So the way to do that, right? You need to, you need to somehow get access to the TCP IP layer because that, that layer does have this information. That's how it implements the TCP stack. So, so, but it doesn't expose it to, you, to us. We, well, we only have uh, these syscalls. So what, so what can we do, right? How can we solve this problem? And that is where uh, this thing called eBPF comes in. So eBPF is this fascinating thing that allows you the, that gives you the ability to execute custom, custom code in the Linux kernel. So, you, and the idea behind here is that your co the code that you execute, right? It's not gonna be some, it's, it's actually gonna be executed in the sandbox and, it'll, and be executed with a JIT compiler that's actually provided by the kernel. So it's kind of like a virtual machine that the kernel provides to you and you can execute, execute this kind of, the special kind of code in it. The code is a subset of C basically, but it's a very strict subset and it will run through some verification steps. So you can't do arbitrary things. Uh, like like access random memory because the, because you're running a kernel space you need this kind of extra layer of security that's why it has all these layers and that's why it's quite a limited subset but it's extremely powerful because it allows you to customize the kernel and just to give you an idea of how it works or how what kind of use cases we would, we would have to do have around it right so what we can do with it is in our case the main thing that we are interested in is observability observability so what we can do is we can use observe we can basically use an UPF SDK. Uh, for example, they have an SDK for Golang, for Rust, whatever you're interested in. You can integrate that SDK, you can write your eBPF code, and then you can send that code to the kernel for it to be run, to be run on the JIT and the verifier and basically do your monitoring. And to give a slightly better idea of, of how that works. So this here's a very quick example. I'm sorry, here's a very quick example how, how it works. So your eBPF programs will normally be event-driven. So they are run whenever the kernel will pass a certain hook. So there are some predefined hooks in the kernel. So these include things like the kernel system calls, all kernel functions that are implemented in the kernel uh, and kernel trace points and kernel network events, et cetera. There's lots of different hooks that you can attach these on. For example, here's a, this is like the classical hello world for eBPF. So I don't know if you guys know this, there's a syscall called execve. This is called whenever you start a new process. So let's say, what you wanna do is you wanna trace all the new processes that are being launched on your system, right? Uh, let's say you wanna log them or something, or you wanna, uh, this is, let's say this is for security reasons or for audit or whatever. The way you can do that is you can actually hook on this exec VE syscall, and then you can execute some custom code. So here the custom code that we're trying to execute is, it'll get the, it'll get the PID and it'll get the command, and then it'll actually submit that to this uh, event, event buffer basically. So we can, we can execute this code and this code will actually execute in kernel space, which is, which is amazing because we finally get the ability to customize the kernel. So uh, how the compilation works is quite interesting. So normally when you, so if you write your eBPF program, what you will do is you, you will compile it using Clang. So Clang has a target called BPF. It's quite, so it's quite simple. You just Clang target BPF, your, your C code, and it'll, it'll produce your eBPF bytecode so that you can then pass to the kernel to load and verify and then run, okay? Uh, so normally the way to do this is there are some sorts of main libraries. So the way, the way we would do it in production, uh, so I'm so currently I'm working on a system to do this, for example. So the way I, the way I do it is we'll use the Go library, for example. Uh, so, so we'll load the UPF program and we'll load some definition of some maps, which is what you need to share data from the kernel to user space. 
and we'll load it in our Go library, and then we'll hook it on some syscall. We'll, we'll run it in the, ver so we'll call the UPF syscall to load the program. It'll verify it, it'll compile it. And then finally, the, the syscall that we're interested in, in this case, send message, receive message, for example, the syscall will run, our EPPF code will run, and then EPPF will send, send data to these EPPF maps, which is how we can then get access to the data in our user space back in our, in our code. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the key idea. Uh, so one of the things to understand that one of the key pieces of machinery that is making this whole thing work is this thing called EBPF maps. So this is the shared memory that we have between user space and kernel space. These are special data structures that EBPF provides for us to share data. And there are many different data structures they provide, things like ring buffers, arrays, hash tables, etc. And basically you can use these to the, the thing is that there are serious performance considerations, right? Because you're in, you're in the kernel layer, you don't want to be slow. So you have to you have to be very careful about what you're doing. So if you're doing some like like for example, if you want to, if you're doing monitoring, it's way better to do aggregate. You don't want to pass raw events to user space because that'll just be very expensive, especially if it's a very high frequency event. So what you want what, what you would do instead is you could do some aggregation in the kernel layer, which will be fast, and then you can send the results of the aggregation to user space. So so that you don't have too much back and back and forth happening. Okay, so uh, yeah. So one of the things that, for example, uh, I'm working on in a side note is this thing called EPF agent, something that's it's, it's a fun project that I'm working on inside our team. And the thing that we're trying to do here is basically like what I mentioned, we're trying to monitor TCP, we're trying to monitor TCP uh, states uh, and TCP level metrics, but, but and analyze them in, in a better way, basically using this, using this system. I'll do a very quick, quick demo for EBPF because uh, I think it's quite a fascinating technology. Uh, not so, so I hope you guys can see my screen. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, let me just, let me just uh, run this. So I hope you guys can see my text. So I'm just gonna run this, uh, I'm just gonna run this simple EBPF program. It's not a very complex one. Uh, so, so, oh, sorry, one second. So it's uh, basically this program will do exactly what I want to do, sort of, but at a, so, so what I want to do is, let's say I want to do, uh, hold on, sorry. Uh, what's it called? Uh, DCP tools. Uh, okay, yes, TCP. So what I'm going to do is I want to measure TCP retransmissions, for example, right? So, and if I want to measure TCP, if I want to see TCP retransmissions, here's something I could run on this server, for example. So th what this program will do is it will actually uh, record all the TCP retransmissions that are happening and give me the IP address for all those retransmissions and the TCP state that they were in when they happen. So here is, uh, here's what, so what's happening here is these are some, these are literally some packets that are being retransmitted and they're happening on these IPs. And I can actually, I can actually uh, then find out more things about these. So similarly, if I want to measure things like, okay, what's my round trip time, for example? All right. So let's say I want to measure in a live streaming sense, for example, let's say I have lots of users connected to my server, and I want to measure how what's their latency to my server, right? So I can use this other tool called TCP RDT to do that. And here, here's a simple example. So this will draw a histogram of how many milliseconds, how many microseconds was their RDT, for example. So in this case. In this case, it's mostly between 16 to 32 uh, milliseconds, which is, which, is, which is quite nice. So, so yeah, I hope that's just a very small brief demo. Uh, I can show you guys the code of how that works later on. But this is a simple like EPF things that you can do with the kernel because uh, you have your you have access to the kernel state. Okay, I think that's all that I have. So, do you guys have any questions at this point? Uh, hi guys. So um, thanks so much for the talk. Um, if anyone in the, the physical venue has questions, we can pass you guys the mic. If there's any other questions on the chat, um, yeah, uh, I can help to read it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so feel free to, I think there was already a question on the chat. Let me just trace upwards. Okay, I think, um, so Jason asked on the chat whether yeah. So when you yeah when you do eBPF tracing, is there an impact on the OS's performance? That's a really good question. So there really there it, there can be if you don't do it right or if you do something expensive, there really can be. That's why you have to be kind of careful. So by by itself, the impact 
of running UPF code is quite small, but it really depends on, so there's not much overhead of running it, but it depends on what you do in your code then. That's what makes the difference. So if you're just, like I mentioned, if you're just, if you're just doing some aggregation or metrics, that will be quite fast. But if you're doing something like where you are sending each event, let's say every packet back to user space, uh, that will obviously be quite expensive. So it really depends on what you are doing in the EPF code. I hope that answers Jason's question. Uh, but hey, Jason, long time no see. Okay, uh, so there's a question by Suji. Um, sorry if I mispronounced. Um, so generally, how do you decide what thresholds to, to alert at during monitoring, especially if you have wildly different loads at different times? That's actually a very good question. And it's a very hard question. And we actually don't have a good solution because uh, everyday load varies a lot. So we have these peaks and troughs. Uh, and, and so, I mean, uh, the easy way to do it is that you can set up some uh, you can set up some rules, right? So, so for like like time of day or something, uh, but it's usually what we do for things that vary. Things like CCU, for example, is we'll do some comparisons with for CCU, for example, we we'll do comparisons with the last twenty four hours because if we need, if you do see big variations, then something is wrong. So, so usually there are certain patterns you can look at. So for traffic patterns, usually. Uh, time is a good thing. So time is a good pattern. So for example, weekend load might be higher than weekday load. So you can, you can compare the week, the, your load, current load with your load last seven days ago, for example. That's usually, and that's just a factor of how humans behave, right? Because humans tend to behave differently on weekends. So normally that's, that's how we do uh, alerting for that. So we have a CCU alert. If our CCU drops below say 10% uh, compared to yesterday's CCU in, in a particular region, then we will get an alert and we'll, we'll look into it. We'll try to look and see what's, what, what's going on. What, what was the problem? Uh, but in some cases, it's not that simple as that. So sometimes we do have some false positives and, this, and these can be a pain in the ass. And you can do, and there are some fancy ways to solve this. You can do some machine learning to train some models that will actually do this for you. So, so, so yeah, this is actually quite a deep topic. Yeah, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah, guys, are there any other questions? Yeah. Oh, Jason had an interesting question. Uh, could you write this in Lisp and use Clang to compile to... I wouldn't do that, man, if I were you. The, e the problem is the EUPF has some helper functions that are only exposed in C. You could write them in other things, but you don't really get any benefit. <laughs> you could do it, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, any other questions, guys? Uh, okay, I, I think at this point, uh, no more questions. Uh, yeah, if if there's no more questions, then yeah, uh, we can wrap up. Thanks so much, Omar, for, for giving uh, no this No worries, talk. guys, thank you. It's super fun. Um, yeah. And yeah, thanks to, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there was applause in the venue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I heard it. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. But uh, thanks, guys, for for actually coming down for our first hybrid Friday hacks for our first sort of physical Friday hacks in any way in quite a long time. So so really grateful to you guys for coming down and making this happen. And thanks too for the online audience. And yeah, y'all can clap if you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks so much, guys. We'll be um, so so just bear with us for a second. Uh, we'll be putting up a feedback form if you guys want to submit any feedback. So just give me a moment. Yeah. Okay, I think you should be, oh no. Yeah, uh, so if you guys can fill in the, the feedback form to, to offer any feedback on the session, especially since this was our first round of the, the hybrid format, 
um, yeah, we'd appreciate that. But otherwise, thanks guys for coming down. Um, and we hope to see you again for next week's talk. We'll update you whether for every week, it kind of depends whether the speakers are available, if we can hold like a physical or online talk. So we'll update that in our publicity. But thanks so much, guys. I think I'll end the recording now.